Zone three. Good morning. Mo Spence from Waterloo, Nebraska. You've often stated that value and growth are opposite sides of the same coin. Would you care to elaborate on that? And do you prefer a growth company that is selling cheap or a value company with, with uh, moderate uh, or better uh, growth pros prospects? Well, well, actually, I think you're, you're, you may be misquoting me, but I, I really said that growth and value, uh, they're indistinguishable. They're, they're part of the same equation. Or really, growth is part of the value equation. So there, I, our position is that there, there is no such thing as, as growth stocks or value stocks, uh, the, the way Wall Street generally portrays them as being contrasting asset classes. Growth usually is a chance to, uh, growth usually is a positive for value, but only when the, it, it, it means that by adding capital now, you add more cash availability later on at a rate that's considerably higher than the current rate of, of interest. So there is no, we don't, we, we, we calculate into any business we buy what we expect to have happen in terms of the cash that's going to come out of it or the cash that's going to go into it. As I mentioned at Flight Safety, we're going to buy $200 million worth of simulators this year. Our depreciation will probably be in the area of $70 million or thereabouts. So we're putting $130 million above depreciation into that business. Now, that can be good or bad. I mean, it's growth. There's no question about it. We'll have a lot more simulators at the end of the year. But whether that's good or bad depends on what we earn on that incremental $130 million over time. So if you tell me that, that you own a business that's, that's going to grow to the sky, and isn't that wonderful? I don't know whether it's wonderful or not until I know what what the economics are of of that growth, how much you have to put in today and how much you will reap from putting that in today later on. And the classic case, again, is the airline business. The airline business has been a growth business ever since, well, you know, that Orville took off. But it's the growth has been the worst thing that happened to it. It's been great for the American public, but the growth has been a curse in the, in the airline business because more and more capital has been put into the business at inadequate returns. Now, growth is wonderful at seize candy because it requires relatively little like incremental investment uh, to sell more pounds of candy. So it's growth, and I've discussed this in some of the annual reports, growth is a part of the equation, but anybody that tells you you ought to have your money in growth stocks or value stocks uh, really does not understand investing. Other than that, they're terrific people. <laughs> Charlie? Well, I think it's fair to say that Berkshire, with a very limited headquarters staff, and that staff pretty old, uh, we are especially partial to laying out large sums of money under circumstances where we won't have to be smart again. In other words, if we buy good businesses run by good people at reasonable prices, there's a good chance that you people will prosper us for many decades without more intelligence at headquarters. And you can say, in a sense, that's growth stock investing. Yeah, if you'd asked Wall Street to classify Berkshire since 1965, year by year, is this a growth business or a value business? A growth stock or value stock, you know, who knows what they would have said. But, you know, the real point is that we're trying to put out capital now to get more capital or money. We're trying to put out cash now to get more cash back later on. And if you do that, the business grows, obviously. And you can call that value or you can call it growth, but, but they're not two different categories. And, uh, I just cringe. When I, when I hear people talk about now it's time to move from growth stocks to value stocks or something like that, because it, it just doesn't make any sense. Zone four. Hi, my name is Stephen Kolb from Irvine, California. I'm 10 years old, and this is my fourth consecutive year here. Terrific. How I got <laughs> We're glad to have you here. Thanks. This is my fourth consecutive year here, and how I got to owning stock is my dad taught me to start my own business, and I bought uh, Brookshire Hathaway stock with my profits. 
that in school they don't teach you how to make and save money, not in high school or college. So my question is, how would you propose to educate kids in this area? Well, that's a good question. Sounds to me like... <clears throat> Sounds to me like you could do a good job yourself, too. I, uh, and, and I'm, you know, at 10, you're, you're way ahead of me. Unfortunately, I didn't buy my first stock until I was 11, so I got a very slow start. And <laughs> it's, uh, you know, what, what it takes really is, and you find it in some classrooms and you don't in others, but you, it takes teachers who, who uh, can explain the subject. Charlie would say Ben Franklin was the best teacher of all in that respect, but uh, uh, you know, it looks like you either got it from your parents an education on that, and parents can do more education, really, in that respect, even than teachers. Um, but it's, you know, I get a chance to talk to students from time to time, and um, you know, one of the one of the things I tell them is, you know, what a valuable asset they have themselves. I mean, it, you know, I would pay any bright student uh, probably $50,000 for 10% of his future earnings the rest of his life. So he's a $500,000 asset just standing there. And, and what you do with that $500,000 asset in terms of develop, developing your mind and your talents is hugely important. The best investment you can make at an early age is in yourself. At, uh, uh, and it sounds to me like you're doing very well in that respect. I congratulate you on it. But I don't have any great sweeping program for doing it throughout the schools, though. I, we, we have, here in Nebraska, we have uh, uh, an annual get-together of uh, students from all the high schools throughout the uh, state, and, and it's a day or two of, of economic education. I think it's a very good, a very good program. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, I think if you just keep doing what you're doing, you may be an example to other students. Uh, Charlie? Well, I'd like to interject a word of caution. You sound like somebody who's likely to succeed at what you're trying to do. And uh, that's not always a good idea. If all you succeed in doing in your life is to get early rich from passive holding of little bits of paper, and you get better and better at only that for all your life, it's a failed life. Life is more. than being shrewd at passive wealth accumulation. I think he's going to do well in both. Zone 5. Good morning. My name is Thomas Kamei. I am 11 years old and from Kenfield, California. This is my fourth annual meeting. Last year, I asked how the internet might affect some of your holdings. Since a lot of the internet companies have got out into business, how are you? Has your view of internet changed? Well, that's a good question, and I I think that the in internet probably looks to most retailers. Uh, like less of a competitive threat than it did a couple of years ago. For example, if you look at the jewelers who have been uh, on the internet, and in many cases, in several cases at least, had very large valuations a couple of years ago. So the world was betting that they would be very effective competitors against, against uh, brick and mortar uh, jewelry retailers. I think that that threat has diminished substantially. I think that's been true in the furniture business. In, in both of those industries, very prominent dot-coms that had aggregate, aggregate valuations in the hundreds of millions have vanished in short order. So I would say that we think the Internet is a huge opportunity for certain of our businesses. I mean, Geico uh, continues to grow <clears throat> in a, at a significant rate uh, in Internet business. Seize Candy's uh, Internet business is up 40% this year. Last year was up a much larger percent from the year before, and it, it grows, uh, and it'll continue to grow. So the Internet's an opportunity, but I think the idea that you could take almost any business idea and, and turn it into uh, wealth 
on the internet. It, many were turned into wealth by promoting them to the public, but very few have been turned into wealth by actually producing uh, cash results over time. So I think there's been a significant change uh, in the degree to which I perceive the internet as a possible threat to our retail businesses. There's been no change in the degree to which I regard it as an opportunity for other of our businesses. Charlie? Well, Warren, you and I were once engaged in the credit and delivery grocery yeah. business, and it was a terrible business. It barely supported one family for a hundred years, with all of them working 90 hours a week. And somebody actually got the idea that that was the, the wave of the future and turned it into a great internet idea. That can only be described as mania, and it sucked in a lot of it intelligent people. Yeah, Charlie is talking about <clears throat> the infamous Buffett and Son grocery store, which did barely support the family for 100 years. And only then did we support the family by hiring guys like Charlie for slave wages. Uh, <laughs> but I, I used to go out on those delivery trucks, and it was pretty damned inefficient. You know, people would phone their orders in, and uh, now it's true we took them down with a pencil and an order pad instead of punching them into a computer. But when we started driving around the trucks and hauling the stuff off and everything, you know, we ran into the same costs that Webvan is running into now. And it, the, the, what the internet offered was a chance for people to monetize the hopes of others, in effect. I mean, you were able to, to, uh, to capture the greed and dreams of millions of people and turn that into instant cash, in effect, uh, through uh, venture capital and the markets. And there was a lot of money transferred in the process uh, from the gullible to the promoters, but there's been very little money uh, created by uh, pure internet businesses so far. Uh, it's, it's been a huge trap for the public. Um, Charlie, anything? Nothing more. Zone six.